just a little over a week ago, we had a robust conversation. I think it went 35, 40 minutes. And, uh, and some of the stuff that we talked about then has already been covered. I'm going to jump right to the question nobody ever seems to ask around here. And I know that in building a business, uh, being on a school board for 10 years that I was in my hometown from 04 to 14, being a state legislator on the education committee, it was the idea of cost. How do you pay for things? So uh, higher education, uh, after you get through high school, uh, when you're out there trying to pursue that pathway of CTE or a four-year degree, has sadly eclipsed uh, in terms of costs going up, health care. The other thing that I've probably been loudest about of any senator, that we need to reform a broken system. You and I spoke about Mitch Daniels, what he did at Purdue. I don't know if you had a chance to look into that, any, but his frozen tuition now, I think for eight, nine years, in a place like this that runs trillion-dollar structural deficits, when so many people look to the federal government to get help. Uh, what are your thoughts on how we uh, do better at getting better value out of post-secondary education and how are you going to weigh in on it? What'd you learn maybe from Mitch Daniels? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And, and uh, you know, I, I did have an opportunity to see how uh, cost-saving measures were, were done in Purdue. And, um, you know, I think my response to that is we need to do that as a nation, we need to really look at exemplars and, and lift them up to say, this is another way to protect students uh, in debt and making sure that we're keeping college costs down, uh, making sure that uh, universities and colleges are using everything at their disposal to uh, make the experience of the learner one that they can afford and that they're not going to be paying for the rest of their life so they can move on to buy a home, start a family, and do the things that they need to do after. So. To answer your question, I would want to make sure that programs like that are elevated, communicated, and that the agency can provide a platform through which uh, we, the left hand learns from the right hand, right? Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of pockets of excellence across our country that people don't know about. So you mentioning it uh, gave me the opportunity to look into it, but I think we need to have a more structured system where we're learning from one another and we're keeping students at the center of the conversation, making sure that college efficiency is one of those topics, and making sure that the return on investment is there for our higher education learners. Well, I'm glad to see that you have that point of view because currently on anything we do here, we borrow about 23% of what we spend. And I think for most parents, uh, stakeholders across the country, good health and good education, and sadly, those are the two most uh, costly part of our economy and society. Uh, it was talked about earlier, uh, Senator Scott, uh, choice. Indiana has led the way on school choice. Uh, I come from a school district, public school district, one of the best in the state. Um, back when I was a school board member, a Catholic high school tried to get started in our hometown. No demand for it, uh, even though the faith-based part, interest in it, but the public school systems were so good. Had a neighboring county who lost one of its three grade schools, the smallest of the three, the best performing due to bad management within that district. So uh, I'd like you to be a little more uh, distinct in what you're going to do in terms of promoting competition and choice, because I think you generally said, I want all schools to do well. Sure. So, you know, I, I went to a technical high school, so I had choice when I uh, went to high school. I could have gone to a, a traditional uh, comprehensive high school. I chose uh, a technical high school, and I think that's healthy, and I think families should have that, students should have that. What I referred to earlier, and I feel pretty strongly about, is that our public schools cannot be a, a poor alternative, that our neighborhood schools not, not public schools, because there are charters that are public also, but our neighborhood schools need to be schools where we want to send our children. And we have to make sure that it's not that they're an alternative or the, the, the uh, least desired alternative, but that it's a high quality uh, alternative for students uh, to, to attend their neighborhood schools. I, I feel pretty strongly about that. I, I think it's pretty clear that public education, uh, public schools in our neighborhoods need to be uh, developed. That's the bedrock of our country. That's the better. That's where our the majority of our students attend, and we have to make sure that it's it's a high quality school for for all kids. And very briefly, the third topic we covered, which has been covered by three or four other senators, 
CTE pathway. I know in building my own business, mm. uh, we do not need more applicants with four-year degrees. We fill those spots with more applicants than that we can really even talk to. It's that right. easy to do. Indiana exports, I think, twice as many four-year degrees as we keep in state. So when it comes to uh, that, a tip that might be uh, pursued is I don't think it'll cost anything. But when I looked into it, even in my own county, we were stigmatizing mm. that pathway. Guidance counselors are that first point where parents and students get to talk to someone. Probably needs to be a little more emphasis on high wage, high demand jobs and that pathway by just changing the paradigm and the point of view. And I don't think that would cost hardly anything. That would just be a pulpit from which you can say a lot about. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree, Senator. And if confirmed, I look forward to this is exciting work. I'm fortunate to have been a part of a Governor's Workforce Council in Connecticut where we brought in our business partners, higher education institution and our K-12, pre-K-12 institutions together to say, let's get this right. Let's work together to get this right, to make sure that these pathways are communicated early in our schools and they're viable options for career and, and great livelihood. For, for our students. So I'm, I'm really eager to get into that work if confirmed. And I look forward to working with you in Indiana and hearing more about the great programs there and uh, making sure that we're sharing those best practices across the country. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Th thank you very much, Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Murray, and congratulations. to so wonderful to say, Chair Murray and also Ranking Member Burr, I am really excited to work uh, with all of you on this committee this year. And congratulations, Dr. Cardona. I am so, um, I have to say, you know, at a, at a time when there is uh, a lot of things going on that aren't going great, it is so exciting for me to hear your uh, commitment and your energy and enthusiasm for this really, really hard work ahead. And um, I think that your experience um, as a classroom educator, as well as a principal and an administrator, is exactly the kind of experience that we, we need in this role right now. So I'm just super excited to hear about this. I think that in this moment, uh, parents and students and educators are all just overwhelmed. Um, the sense of responsibility and accountability and challenge in this moment is really palpable. I see this all the time in Minnesota, and I can see from the conversations with my colleagues in this committee today that we are all experiencing that. And I think it's um, one of the reasons why you're getting asked great questions about where we go from here. You can see a lot of us on both sides of the aisle have great interest in career and technical education um, at our shop as Senator um, Scott um, is calling it, where we can really um, broaden our ideas about how students can um, build forward to great careers and great jobs and great lives um, beyond a four-year education, and I certainly agree with that. Um, so, but I want to ask you about something in particular that is um, you and I had a chance to talk with talk about a little bit when we were together. I so enjoyed our conversation. Um, you know, as we think about how in this country. We can continue the work of fulfilling the promise that our country holds for everyone in this country. I'm thinking a lot about Minnesotans and Americans who are new Americans, who are immigrants. Um, and I know that in my state, diversity in culture and language is not just something that we see in Minneapolis and St. Paul and the big cities. It's something that we see in regional centers like Wilmer and Worthington and um, Fairmont. You know, we have about um, 74,000 students in Minnesota that do not speak English as their first language. I think it's 5 million um, in America. And certainly learning um, English as a second or third language is um, complicated and is, is challenging, but I think so much about what an opportunity this is and um, how much this adds to our, our, our classrooms and our schools and the experiences of all children. So could you just speak for a little bit, I know you've given this a lot of thought, could you talk some about how we should support English language learners and immigrant students and what you've seen that works and how we could build on that um, as we go forward? Thank you for the question, uh, Senator. I, I wholeheartedly agree that uh, not only should we be you know, encouraging um, uh, having more than one language, bilingualism, but also we should be acknowledging not only by but bilingualism, but biculturalism. I think you know, they go together and that we honor our students' bilingualism by also honoring their culture. 
Uh, and and I, I truly enjoy the conversation I had with you about this. And, you know, as, as a classroom teacher and as a principal, moving, moving along the lines, when you're able to do that, you build community in the schools, number one, because they feel more engaged. But in terms of the language development piece, you know, research is pretty clear on how you learn a language, a second language. And unfortunately, in, in many cases, what we've done is we've uh, subtracted L1 to, to replace it with L2. And then later, we offer a prestigious elective of that same language that the student came with uh, as a high school elective. So we really have to rethink how we're doing this and understand the value and benefit of not only being bilingual in this country, but being bicultural um, and your ability to work globally if, if you can do that. Yeah, well, as I think you were saying when we spoke, language is culture. And too often we think of students that need to learn English as, as you know, their, their first language, if it isn't English, is a barrier that they have to overcome rather than an asset that they have for themselves, but also, as you're indicating, an asset for the entire classroom as all the kids can learn from one another about their different languages and their different cultures. So um, I, I just couldn't agree with you more. And I think that that is going to be something that's going to be exciting to work on as we um, as we move forward. I don't have much time left, but I want to just also acknowledge, uh, Dr. Cardona, that we uh, we had also a really great conversation about the importance of addressing mental health issues in classrooms. Uh, this is um, mental health issues among students, even if they're not in classrooms right now. I think is also overwhelming, and I look forward to the work that we can do together on this. This is also a bipartisan issue. I think Senator Murkowski and I have worked together on this issue along with others. So uh, lots of work ahead there as well, and good work. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we will turn to Senator Marshall. Welcome to our committee. Well, Madam Chair, thank you so much, and it's an honor to be here with you today. And Ranking Member Burr, thank you for the invitation to come. Dr. Cardona, welcome. Thank you. you and I have so much in common. We're both first-generation college kids that went on to pursue and obtain doctorate's degrees. Community colleges seem to be something of interest to you. My wife and myself, both community college graduates. And then I think lastly, uh, how important family is to you, that we are part of a loving family that's uh, supported us, whose education was a priority. And as I think about success of students, what, what makes, a, what's makes a student successful and, and loving parents and good educators are always a, a good, a great key and a great indicator. And I appreciate your commitment to those. I want to go back to community colleges for a second. I'm so proud of my community colleges across the state of Kansas. The Perkins grants, TRIO grants are several uh, opportunities as well. And my dream is that not only would seniors in, in high school, but juniors and sophomores would start getting a little bit of college credit. And by the way, you know, how do you drive the cost of college down? And one of it is getting some of those credits back in high school and uh, maybe finishing in four years. And if you can't, if you have to borrow money to a university, maybe you should think about a community college. I'll just give you a second to expand on your vision for community colleges. Thank you, thank you, and uh, I appreciate the, the question and the statements you made earlier. Uh, you know, community colleges are critically important to not only rebuilding after the pandemic, but really just our plan forward in education. And I think they serve the community. I mean, it's in the name. And what we need to do more is make those programs uh, more available or more accessible earlier for our learners so that they can look for first generation college students in particular who might think about college and think early on, oh, that, that's not for me, I can't afford it. We need to really remove those barriers, those mental barriers that may exist generationally and really give them access to that. But community colleges can also provide opportunities for students to explore pathways that they might not have considered in the past. So. Good coordination with uh, pre-K-12 systems and community college systems are going to be really important to make college accessible to more, more students. Great. Thank you. And, you know, moving on to the next subject, one of the top concerns for Americans right now, maybe number one for many, many families, is getting our children back in school. And I want to talk about that for a second. As an obstetrician, took care of many women with viruses. And if I learned one thing about viruses, they constantly change and, and how people react to them is differently, and especially pregnant women. Whether it's chicken pox or, or West Niles virus, uh, we, each pregnant woman react differently